Welcome. Um, we'll be starting quarter past. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a quick survey here. How many guys? How many of you guys started the program in September this year on campus? Here, on site. Okay. And how many are from Hyderabad? Okay. I feel like we're missing some people. All right, but it's not far past. So, <laughs> so this um, uh, this um, as you got my message, I assume that they will be live streaming this. Uh, this is not so that you avoid going to the lectures. Uh, it's more to accommodate the, gu the guys that have been stuck with their visa applications. Uh, and you will have a much greater experience than the guys that are viewing this online. So, um, this is the first time I'm live streaming a presentation. So, uh, I expect technical difficulties during the way. No problem. Um, so we seem to have been receiving a little bit of winter this this day. Feels nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but t I think the temperature is okay, minus two or something like this. Um, on Saturday, I was a little bit shocked because I saw the temp temperature where I'm living, it was minus nine. Uh, yeah, that's a bit ch chilly. Uh, you, as we are in the south of Sweden, we usually have a moderate temperature or climate. So, this is what I would expect winter to be, but it can, within the normal region of variation, become minus 10 uh, as, as a, on a normal day. The, the coldest I've experienced down here is minus 25. Uh, minus 25 and 50 centimeters, 50 centimeters of snow. Um, when we have more than 10 centimeters of snow, uh, perhaps even five, the, the local transit takes a little bit longer because the buses uh, spin their wheels, they don't get grip, 
Um, and all cars are driving much slower because of the, it's easy to skid when it's snow and it's not plowed. So have that in mind when you're planning your travels. Um, if you're normally, if you normally take 10 minutes to travel or 20 minutes to travel by bus, assume the double when, if there's a lot of snow. You usually can hear it in the morning. If there's a lot of snow, it's very much more quiet compared to a normal day like this. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, have everybody received access to Canvas? Yes. Have you been assigned groups? Yes. Have you read uh, so, so when I said access to Canvas, that means that you can log on to Canvas and you see your classes. Um, those that do not see their classes, um, have you registered on the student portal? Yes. <laughs> well, if you have access to Canvas, yes. uh, uh, then everything is fine. But if, if you have access to Canvas, you don't see your classes, then you should make sure that you have registered on the student portal. Once you have registered, I, I, I'm not f sure how frequent the update is, but it, I think it's around uh, every 24 hours during the night, they, they take the guys that are registered in student portal, match against what you're supposed to be registered against, and then transfer you or uh, enable access to the classes in Canvas. So if you don't have access today, now, and you register now, you will not have access to Canvas until tomorrow, I guess. I wonder how many you can if you can see how many people are viewing the screen. Fourteen people, thirteen people. Um, This will be difficult for me. So what are you back? Uh, so anybody feel like we're missing someone? Yes. Okay. Let's let's give them a couple more minutes. This is a very intense class. Have you checked out the schedule? Mm -hmm. 
So basically, during the first three weeks, we have... I'm going to repeat this anyway in, in not so short, such so, so a long time, but we have all of the theory lectures. Um, parallel to those, you need to read the books. Um, and I would ar argue that you should focus on the Limoncelli book, um, the Seifert book, and then the um, Crusoe and Ross book. I assume that you have the knowledge of the Crusoe and Roe book, because that's basic IP. That's the reason why the book is included. But the Limoncelli book talks about experiences from a uh, operator, but not, not from a from a system administrator's point of view. And that knowledge is uh, is very useful. You need to the the procedures or the way that he's presenting his experience and their experience there is, is vital. The ciphered book is just to get the nitty-gritty details about Ethernet. Because I don't think the Cruiser Row book includes that, that enough about that in there. Um, there is no reading list in the book, in the class. So you have to identify the knowledge that you need and you need to inquire it. You are now at an advanced level of education, so finding information, obtaining it, filtering it, and making use of that information you need is expected of you. And this is the most, this is the most critical learning you can ever do. Uh, technologies, methods, these things change. Technology is faster than methods. But learning how you learn as an individual is the most important aspect for you to learn. You should have an idea of how to do that already now. You have completed, you're assumed to have completed a bachelor. So I'm not providing you with a reading list. Anymore. Read this chapter, these sections, or these pages. You have to identify what you need in order to, to move on with the assignments. All right. Okay. So. Let's go then. So, welcome to ET 2598. If you're not subscribed to this class, it's the wrong room. <laughs> but I hope you've realized that by now. So the class is called Network and Service Operations. Um, this is the first lecture. Um, hopefully it's not going to be a full day or full two hours. But I'm going to talk about the introduction, terms, concepts, principles, architecture, and topology. The aim with this one is to introduce the class. So, the outline uh, for this presentation is course description, aims, and goals. Why are we doing this class? Talk a little bit about the schedule. And then the thing that all students should pay extra attention to, examination. Um, talk about the data sources and the tools, and there will be coming some ex uh, additional information after that. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, I will, uh, we'll talk about them right away. The course aim. The course aim is to provide knowledge in processes, methods, and technologies for installing, operation and maintenance of networks and associated services. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I translate that into an ability. 
that you should be able to design a network. Um, you should be able to have a conversation with a customer that wants a network, obtain the requirements and translate their requirements into specifications, then build that network, operate it, monitor it, and at some point in the future, either transition that network into another network or from one state to something else, either upgrading capacity or behavior or downgrading, and eventually actually it would probably be good if you also know how to decommission a network, how to pull it out. Um, I want you to build awareness regarding the challenges associated with the scaling, services, and users. I guess everybody has set up their own uh, small Wi-Fi network or small home network, and that's an easy PC. You just plug in it, and everything is already pre-configured. You don't do anything. When we go to a larger scale, suddenly you have issues where you have a bunch of users that require a certain service to be available all the time. Let's take an example of a service like DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, as you perhaps hopefully know. If you disable that service, the network is probably not going to work that smooth. Um, um, so, um, all right. Um, and how about scaling? It's, it's, it's the same thing as I said before, coming back to the home network. It's one thing to have a home network of five or ten users. 20 users compared to having a multi-tier network where you have thousands of users or tenth of thousands of nodes. Things are different. Um, and I want you to have and get an overview of network and service configuration and how to monitor these. Now, these things are continuously evolving. So some of the things we perhaps bring up might be, I'm not going to say old, but perhaps not the absolutely brandest, coolest keywords. But you need to know the principles and the fundamentals before you, you um, go to the higher level or absolutely bleeding edge. Because usually the bleeding edge is just a version of a pre-existing technology. Um, but you need to know how to monitor, configure services and networks. The goals of knowledge and understanding uh, I want you to be able to propose and argue for a network architecture. So it's not like, well, here's the network. If someone asks, why should I have that architecture? You should be able to provide an answer. And if they propose a different architecture, you should be able to argue why yours is the way it is. Perhaps they propose a better architecture, then you should argue that yours is better. But you should be able to <coughs> propose and argue for your arch the architecture that you propose. That means that you also need to understand how to interpret an architecture. What is the benefit? What are the drawbacks? Um, I want you to be able to understand or describe the challenges that may arise when you modify an existing network. So modification of an existing network, that is not <coughs> adding hosts. Modification of a network is modifying the architecture, like replacing switches, which is probably not that a big deal, unless that switch suddenly has VLANs, which then suddenly becomes a little bit more complicated, 
before you move a router. And then things are really becoming a little bit more complicated if you start moving networks around within your topology. Um, and then I want you to be able to explain the challenges that exist when you scale a network. And then that is both applying to scaling up and scaling down. So the skills and the ability I want you to have, I want you to be able to design and implement a simple network. So I would actually probably say that that should perhaps not be simple, but a moderate network. Not an advanced, but a moderate network. A simple network is a router and a bunch of hosts, right? We should take that one step further, or perhaps two steps further. Uh, I want you to be able to initiate an operator mo monitoring system for oper monitoring networks and services. And primarily network services. So DNS, DHP, firewalls, caches, things that are services that the network might provide. But you can generalize that into any service. And then we're talking applications, web servers, cloud things, etc., etc. Um, and then I want you to have a skill to use the basic tools that are used for managing these networks and services. This is the goal that I want to have. This is the, these are the goals that are defined in the curriculum. And these are the things that the examination will test you on, that you meet. Hmm. Approach. I, of course, go approach. So, it also, we also want you to be able to evaluate problems associated with managing large networks and services. So if you're being presented with a user or an environment where, hey, we have a problem with our network, you should be able to do troubleshoot on that network and identify where or where where or on, in what, what or what locations or configurations the problem might be found. Um, so that's, that's a tricky thing. To be able to troubleshoot, you need to know how things work. And then, based on that information and knowledge, identify where things are going wrong. It's like debugging a software. When your compiler says segmentation fault, you need to be able to figure out what does that mean? Where is the fault? Usually, in that case, the compiler says, or the program says where it is. But you have to be able to dissect it, so to say. So the schedule, for the first three weeks, we have Monday lectures, then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday we have exercises. I hope everybody has been assigned a group. If not, I'm assigning you to groups as you are being sh showing up in Canvas. Um, group one is on Mon Tuesdays. Group two is on Wednesdays, and group three is on Thursday. Uh, then we have a lecture on Wednesday, and we have a lecture on Friday. Um, the Friday exercise here is done online. So there's, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have, Thursday, we have classrooms booked, so every group can then join or should join. 
Um, but the Friday exercise is done online. So at that point, you are assumed to work on your own laptop <coughs> or wherever you want in the computer rooms here. You work on the exercise. <coughs> and if you have questions, then you can go online. I haven't decided, <coughs> sorry, if we're going to use the, the chat discussion forum on uh, Canvas or we can use IRC. How many are familiar with IRC? One. Hmm? The reason why I bring up IRC, Internet Relay Chat, is that a lot of the open source projects, they are using IRC for a semi-live way of communication. Um, and if you're using some of these tools, you can use the IRC channel to ask that community for help or even contribute. So if, for instance, in my case, I'm working with Juju and Mass. I am not a contributor with them, but I have worked enough with them that I can help answer simple questions on these topics. And that helps other guys to pick up these things and move on. But that applies for the Friday exercise, the online exercises that are scheduled throughout this class. Questions? No? So, examination. This is going extremely rapid. Uh, there are three assignments. Each represents approximately 40 hours of work. Yeah, 40 hours of work. That's one full week. That is the reason why the assignments are available already now. Um, the workshops, we will... Um, these assignments will be combined with workshops. Um, the idea in the workshops, which will be just one four-hour slot, for, is that you know the problem or the assignment you're solving. So prior to the workshop, you have spent perhaps, I would say, 20 hours on that workshop or that assignment you have read up on it you have tried to solve it you worked on it and then we have a workshop where everybody in that group meets and discuss so during these workshops you are expected to do an, have an active participation that is why we divide it into groups. And active participation means that you need to be able to present your ideas, your thoughts, reason to argue for your solutions, and perhaps even give a small presentation for your solution, or your idea, or your issues. My view is on that twofold. I want one that we actually get a discussion going because a lot of engineering work and scientific work is done through discussions. So you need to be able to communicate with other people, both verbally and written. And then I, I am aware that a lot of students are not comfortable presenting in front of the class. So hopefully we can get a little bit of presentation practice as well going on. Because there's no easy way of saying this, but the way that you get comfortable presenting is to present. Uh, so so, so those, are, that, those are the ideas with the workshops. We can get a discussion both on technical and all other aspects with the assignment. 
an active participation is required, I'm going to use that as an input when I do the grading. So sitting in the workshops like this is not going to help you grade. Um, at the end of that week of the workshop, you are supposed to, you are re required to submit a written report. Um, last year, I experienced that some people are, are not accustomed to writing reports. Um, if you have, if you're uncomfortable or you haven't been exposed to writing reports, please let me know. I will not remove you from writing the report because that's the examination, but I might be able to guide you and hint you on where you can find information and practice before doing that report that is examined. And, and from my view, it's, it's a matter of self-preservation on my effect because I need to have a report that I can read and understand and then on top of that, it makes technical sense. Um, in F, if I get report that I don't understand or I cannot read, I cannot judge the technical content, right? The reports are graded with just pass or fail. Nothing else. Then on t at the end, there is a report that is another 48, 40 hours. Um, I would urge you to start looking at that already now. There is no workshop, as far as I remember, with that one. So, but the idea is that the first previous three workshops will help you to build the knowledge to be able to complete the report, the final report. Again, the Final report is 48, expected to be 40 hours of work. So if you take those 120, that's 160 hours of work you're looking ahead of you until March. Um, you should plan your time accordingly. The report is not graded with a pass or fail, it's graded with an A to F. Um, getting A is difficult, extremely difficult. Uh, an E is passed. That means I can read it, I can understand it in a technical sense, makes technical sense. That's the pass. If I can read it, I can understand it, doesn't make technical sense, that's an F. If it makes technical sense, difficult, but if I cannot understand it. But if I can understand it, it doesn't make technical sense. You, you kind of understand how it is. So it's difficult to get the, get the higher grades. Now, I should say that I don't want you to focus on the grades on this course. Focus on passing this course. Do not delay working. I'm sad to say, but the previous batch of students that took this class last year, none has passed it yet. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure if it's too difficult or it's just uh, different. I've talked to other people and they don't think it's too difficult. So, the data sources, the literature that uh, Harish Kumar wanted is now shown on screen. Um, those that have access to Canvas, you can, you see these on the lectures there. I'm going to update them because those that are there are a little bit outdated. I've updated them since. Uh, but the, the, the first one, Practice and System Network Administration, this is the primary one. 
then I would say this one and then that one. This is just for if you want to learn about cloud a little bit more. Uh, then there is Google, Bing and the internet and YouTube. I have placed a couple of online references, a couple of YouTube videos in the course in Canvas. I would say those could be good locations to start a topic. But they are not sufficient to learn a topic. Uh, and this is something I would perhaps argue on a general view of YouTube. YouTube is very good at providing different views of a topic, but it's not sufficient. You cannot watch a video on YouTube and learn how to program. It's not sufficient. If you watch a video on YouTube, read a couple of tutorials, perhaps even a book, you might be able to learn how to program. If you do all of the previous things and try to program, then you might learn how to program. I am a strong believer of the concept of learning by doing. And you need to do to learn. If you read a book, watch a video, and do not apply the knowledge that you gain from either of those sources, you have not really learned. Um, and the aim is learning here, right? So I would be cautious about YouTube and Google and the internet. Um, I'm not throwing it out. I think it's a very good source. Um, everything depends on how you as an individual learn. Um, but I would strongly advise against just watching YouTube. I, I'm, I'm, I'm iterating this because I had students that spent all their time watching YouTube and they haven't learned a, anything. Just take this for example of for, for food for thought. How long does it take for you to read a page in a book? Two minutes? One minute? How much knowledge can there be in one page book page compared to one minute of video? The book can contain so much more information. Well, I'm not watching one minute videos, I'm watching 10 to 15 or 30 minutes video. Yeah, but if you spend 30 minutes reading a book or tutorial and then practicing, you will have learned so much more than these 30 minutes watching YouTube. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, and then the last part here, the caveat here. The, the internet is good for many sort information sources, but there's also a lot of crap on the internet. Uh, so pay attention to what you ever find. Just because you find one reference or one link online, that does not mean that it's true. I would say that one thing that is good with the internet in that sense is you can have, usually, if it's a topic that is of somewhat interesting to some amount of people, you can get a lot of different viewpoints. And perhaps you can find a viewpoint that, uh, that apply, um, not applies, but uh, matches your way of understanding. And that's the trick. I would say. 
looking at the same data from different angles, from different viewpoints, and eventually you become aware that this is a ball, right? So multiple viewpoints, multiple way of expressing the same thing, that's the good thing with the internet. But pay attention. So, uh, tools we'll be using in this class. We'll be using Cisco Packet Tracer. I hope everybody have received their invitation to NetPad. The Cisco uh, Network Academy, because in that one there are a couple of classes or topics that I want you to pursue. Um, I'm not going to grade them or use them as a feed for, uh, base for your for your grading, but there are a couple of knowledge that you need to have. Packet Tracer is one of them, because you'll be submitting packet traces to you. You need to be able to use VirtualBox or VM Player. Um, how many have used VirtualBox? Keep your hands up. I'm slow at counting. Okay, all right, so there's, how many has used VM Player? Okay. So VirtualBox, it is that. Um, so VirtualBox is used, as you guys know, it's for virtual machines on your device. Uh, we'll be talking or using SSH, Netcat, and Telnet, perhaps. We might be using Git, Ansible, and Bash. And I would say those that are not familiar with Linux or command line, you better get ready for Linux and command line. Uh, those, a couple of those Linux, one of the classes in Net Academy. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here. Yeah, I'm talking more about that later. So these are some of the tools we'll be using, or you will be using. Uh, this is the timeline that is planned. Uh, so during the first three weeks, again I'm iterating this, this is where we're going to have the lectures. We will also, I will also be expecting you to be reading the literature. So basically you should be covering two or three books uh, during three weeks. That's one book per week. <laughs> Speed reading is a very simple te uh, skill that is very important to learn. Um, we also be doing exercises to train you a little bit before the workshops. <clears throat> Three weeks from now, we'll, we're going to have the first workshop. And then second, and then third, and then the fourth workshop. And <clears throat> during the week 11, there's repetition if needed. And here is the deadline when you submit your final reports. After each workshop week, you submit a report. Uh, the course ends on the 15th of March. And on that day, I fly to China for a couple of weeks. So I will not be available for questions. <laughs> so I just saw that the dates co coincided with my travel. Um, so These are three very intense weeks. 
And to you guys that are watching this from online, you need to do the same things as the guys that are present. Because when you get here in workshop one, if you arrive at that point in time, you need to be ready. Questions? So, the lectures. Today is the introductionary lecture. Tomorrow, I think it's going to be Ethernet, uh, on Wednesday, it's going to be Ethernet. Tomorrow is the first uh, exercise. And the exercise is available online, so you can see it, read it, and prepare for it. And, and um, we're going to have a lecture about layer two to three protocols and services. Uh, bringing that up because it's the interaction between layer two and layer three is one of the probably one very important knowledge to have because a lot of issues can occur there. We're going to talk about management, virtualization, configuration, and that includes dependencies. Monitoring, real-time performance, and automation, orchestration, DevOps, and testing at the end. Um, <clears throat> so those are the lectures. Uh, these are complements to the books. It's not sufficient to watch the lectures and not read the books. On the other hand, you cannot just read the books and ignore the lectures. So they are complementing each other. And then on top of that, we throw in the exercises so that you can do, you can learn by doing stuff. Uh, sometimes I run these lectures as seminars. Uh, I think that might be wrong. That should probably be in the workshop parts. Okay. So I think there might be a fault here, but active participation is always good. Uh, we're going to talk about automation pets and cattle. We're going to talk about automation planning. Uh, pets and cattle comes from uh, Limoncelli. Uh, planning, network design principles, monitoring, merging networks and service, and operational tools. These are also items we'll be talking about. So we're coming back to the examination of the workshops. These are mandatory. If you, for some reason, cannot attend a workshop. Now each group just have one workshop slot. You need to let me know in advance and then I can probably move you to another group. But you need to be present or have a valid reason. And a valid reason if you're going to the doctors or something like that, notify me in advance. And then I might be able, that's a valid reason, but then you will probably have to do some additional tasks to mitigate from the lack of attendance during that workshop. Um, so you need to be actively participating in the discussion, proof sense your thoughts, ideas, views and understanding. Reason, give and receive feedback. So with that meaning, um, let's say I present a really shitty idea really stupid. Uh, we should be, build our network using um, mobile phones. We, everybody turn on their Wi-Fi sharing and that builds our network. That's not a great idea, right? Um, then you should be able to tell me that in a not, hey Patrick you're so stupid. How do you think that works? But you should be able to express yourself in a, a constructive, well, 
How do you think that would work? You will just congest the airwaves, right? That's not. And, and, and me, as a receiver with the feedback, should be able to receive it, not like, well, why are you picking on me, right? So re giving and receiving feedback is, is a two-way street. So when you see something that's less than great, or you think that is bad, express that in a kind, constructive way. Uh, next time around, it might be you that are on the receiving end. So, so, so you should be able to reason, give, and receive feedback. And then at the end, you're going to write a report on the assignment where you reflect or include the discussions we had at the workshops that helps you to provide a your final report on that particular topic. So, how about what will these workshops and assignments be about? So, workshop one is about network design it's actually a two-part solution here. It's network design. The first one is about network design goals and constraints. How should we do the network? And the second part is monitoring design, goals, tools, and requirements. Um, so the report will be about presenting two designs for two simple networks including architecture, technology, and operational considerations, and how and what to monitor in the network. So we monitor everything. That's not enough. You have to agree. We, we are going to monitor this, like this. We're monitoring this, like this. We're using these tools for that. And uh, then network design here is present the design. Where, how will you are, and what resources will you be using? How much capacity, equipment, etc., etc. So you need to probably have a tool that allows you to draw networks or principal network drawing. Workshop two, that is about how can we merge two enterprise networks with duplicate service into one consolidated network. Um, the idea is that we have two enter companies, enterprises, that are completely operational on their own. They are then one purchase the other, and now we want to merge these two networks. So instead of having duplicates of everything, how can we merge it into one network? And that's not if, like, okay, everybody turn off your stuff, we reconfigure the network, and everybody power on when we say so, right? Actually, that's one way of doing it, but I think that would have a very bad impact on the operations of the company. And just because you need to change the network doesn't mean everybody. It's like if I were to go to the, say BJH, we need to re, be, we need to change our network. All right, so on the twenty second of January, everybody stays home, no staff, only the networking engineers here, no students. <laughs> Have a nice day off. It's not going to work, right? So, so, so that is the idea that with that part. The second part is once we have or we have, we have a new network, how do we scale that when we go from n nodes to two nodes to 10 nodes? 
what are things that we have to have in mind then? What architectural IDs are perhaps worth incorporating from the beginning in the network? Of course, you have to weigh that against cost, but how do, can we do that? How can we scale it up? Um, so in the report, you should be able to describe the problems that can arrive when modifying the existing networks, phase one, uh, and then exemplify what happens when you add, remove, and scale. All right. Workshop three. Um, this is a programming assignment, usually. So, if you're not familiar with programming, you should learn programming. You're free to pick whatever language you want. Um, you should be able to use some basic tools required to manage communications, networks, and associated services. Um, so, in the workshop, we talked about configuration and deployment. And how do we do that on scale? And monitoring, how do we monitor? How do we monitor on scale? What should we monitor? Um, and then there usually is the, the workshop three doesn't usually or has only been given once, but at that point in time, it was a programming assignment to write a small program that does some very simple monitoring of devices. Um, the idea with that is that you get an experience of doing something very, very low level. So you understand the basic engines, one of the basic engines that is used for monitoring. And then you can know that if I'm using this higher level application it says I'm depending on this engine, you actually know what's going on at the, at the lower level. And in the four, final report, workshop four it's called here, but it's the final report. This one um, evaluates that you can propose and argue for a communication network architecture and evaluate the problems that can occur during the administration and management of these ne this network. As far as I remember, it's about proposing an architecture and a solution where you're, it's a gaming company that, uh, uh, how, many guys, how many of you are, guys are familiar with Fortnite or PUBG? <laughs> All right, so those are, or one of them is a very large online game, right? Um, and now we, this company here, we're talking about, they have started a competitor last night or whatever we would call it. Uh, but how do we scale that to handle the amount of players that are ex we're expecting? How do we commission our resources? How do we deploy them in multiple sites? So, so that one, that kind of brings everything together on the, on the class. Questions so far? No? So exercises. Um, here are a bunch of exercises. Uh, packet tracer with basic in networking, host devices and connections. Layer two network setup config. We're gonna talk, there are some exercises about remote access configuration, telnet and SSH. How many know SSH? Right. You know the abbreviation, but can you use it? Um, SNMP and friends, monitoring and availability, monitoring push versus pull, VM container configuration, and network device configuration. 
Now, some of these exercises are on your own. They are self-exercises. So you can ask questions, perhaps, but you have to figure it out and do them on your own. Now, the exercises are not here to make your life difficult. They are here to help you to learn. Um, in the afternoon, or perhaps now, after this talk, because I don't have that many slides left, I want to make sure that you can log on to Netacad. Because this is where you're, we're going to have a couple of classes, or self-study classes, that are really good for you. As I said before, I will not be tracking your progress, but these are skills and knowledges that, that you will benefit from, from having. And you, I'm going to assume that you have them when you get to the exercises and workshops. Uh, those guys that have not received an invite from Netacad, please let me know. Can take that after. If, if you don't have it, let me know afterwards. Um, so, uh, once you've signed in to Netacad, you can sign up for four classes. The first one I want you to sign up for is MGG uh, Linux Unhatched. It's a self paced class, it helps you to get going with the Linux. Then I want you to uh, sign up for the I2PT, Introduction to Packet Tracer. They might have changed it into something with IoT or something now. But Google, uh, search Netacad for Introduction and Packet Tracer, or Packet Tracer Introduction or something, or just Packet Tracer. Uh, Packet Tracer is a Cisco simulation tool that allows you to build networks in your computer and simulate them. Uh, there's another simulator that's called GNS3. Um, I'm cons you should perhaps pay a little bit of attention to that as well uh, because it's probably going to be useful for you. I had a student that started working for Cisco and I asked him, hey, what do you think I should use for a simulation tool in this network service operation class? And he said, GSN3. He is from Cisco that has packet tracer, so I was a little bit per perplexed there. Uh, but I'm sticking with packet tracer in this iteration of the class because, because of I have not been able to set up GSN3 properly. Uh, but you need to take a class in introduction to Packet Tracer. The third one, be your own boss. And that's a very personal, interesting knowledge class. How do you pace yourself and how do you control your environment so that you can plan your own time? So be your own boss is a good class. Um, and then there's this network and service operations class, which is basically NGD Linux Essentials. And this is a class that I signed you up for. And you should take it because it also focuses on Linux skills that you need to have. Um, so for the group that starts their workshop tomorrow, group one, you should do this one first, then perhaps that one, and, and that one, then this one. There's no order, but before your first workshop, which will be about Packet Tracer, uh, before, before, sorry, before your work, your exercise, you need to know Packet Tracer or how to. You need to have downloaded it, and you need to know how to do basic operations in it. So, 
So these are things you can do when you are bored with your exercises, uh, bored at reading, um, basically when you have some time off. <laughs> not when you have time off, because you're not going to have any time off. But these are good knowledge sources. I don't see a reason to repeat them in the class because they are there. Um, and you need to know Linux and you need to know program, especially in the upcoming classes. These classes are not talking about programming. Questions? No questions. Ah, some questions you must have. Sir, we got uh, 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 sister and uh, the Academy mail, but we cannot access this uh, account. Login. Cisco uh, the Academy. Okay. Didn't that inside? Did, uh, was that not in, in the I got the number. Uh, my uh, next uh, next Academy ID number. Yeah. But uh, application is failed. Okay. Um, uh, have you created a, an account on Net Academy? Oh, we need to uh, create this account, or otherwise, the university offers this one. That's it. No, I don't think so. So the Net Academy account is not associated with your BTH account. I was surprised that you, when you got the invitation, that it didn't say, "Hey, generate an account." Uh, but if if you got an invite, or whatever it's called, uh, make sure that you use the same email address when you create your account. <laughs> More questions? Okay. Um, I just have to answer that. For, for the <coughs> books that you recommended for us, do you have a software version? That you like? I hope so. You can use the BTH library to find them. I think they're all open, um, open books available online. I have not provided a link. I don't, because that if I grab the link last year, it would have changed. If I had. More questions? From your if it explanation the other time, does that imply tomorrow it's only member of group one that will come into class? Uh, one more time. Tomorrow, it's exercise for group one. Only group one. On Tuesday, it's just group two. So in the schedule, has everybody seen or have access to the schedule? You know how to get the schedule? You know. <laughs> you guys that are here, obviously, either have access or have good friends. Uh, but it's schedule.pth.se, and then you ongoing class, and then you type ET2598. And then show. 
I would propose that you subscribe to that schedule. So, because I expect everybody have a smartphone. And if you subscribe to that in your Google or Mac or whatever, you will get a notification when there's, when there's a lecture or an, an event going on. More questions? No. Right. All right, then I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the terminology and concepts with regards to networking. I am, this picture that you're seeing here should not frighten you. If it does, you need to be doing a little bit more reading. So, what we have here is a simple to moderate network. There is There's only one router at the top connecting to the internet. So viewing this, you should have an idea how, how this network works or can possibly work. So you have your router up here, you have a firewall, and then you have a core switch, and then access switches and additional switches. So, this should not be frightening. Uh, I would guess in this scenario here, you will have a fair amount of uh, VLANs present, um, tying things together that belong together, uh, separating things that are not supposed to be talking to each other directly, um, but these are the, the, this is how a normal network would look. So the terminology that is to, to remember here is we have the edge switches. These are the entities that are connecting to uh, the edge, the last nodes, the leaves of the tree, if we're calling it like that. That, that's the farthest out. This would be a leaf. That's a leaf. The thing that I'm connecting to is an edge device. Perhaps an edge device is better called. But in the case that there are switches, they're called edge switches. The wireless access point is another edge device. And here we could perhaps argue a little bit whether or not this is an edge switch or not. It's definitely an edge device. Uh, then we have the distribution switches or the media, intermediate layer between the edge, edge switches and the core switch or switches. Um, so edge device, distribution switches, core switches, and then we have router. Now you, all the terminology I said, you can take that and probably replace that with edge router, edge distribution router, and core router as well. Uh, but the, the, Core terminology here is perhaps the, the the tiers, the edge distribution and core. This is quite frequently how the things are named. Um, in this particular architecture, why do you think they have put a NAS 
and computer services servers to the core switch. Any thoughts, ideas? How many people do you think will, uh, what alternative locations could we have for these entities? Um, I think this is a little bit, we're missing uh, desktops or workstations, right? Mm -hmm. But assume, let's say that we have our workstations. Well, here we have computers, right? So let's say, well, ah, here we have a computer. So let's put it down here. So here are people working. And let's assume they're storing stuff on their storage, right? Wouldn't it be smarter to have the storage down here? If there are people using on the other side of the network. Correct. I, I would be, that would be my reasoning too. Uh, if we place it down here, on that entity, the guys that are sitting in down here will have an excellent experience. They can just boom, boom, talk directly to it. On the other hand, the guys that are sitting over here, they have to go all the way over here like this. We're talking a few milliseconds, but we're talking uh, one, two, three, four switches to pass through. Mm -hmm. Now, get, that is given that they can communicate to each other. They're on the same VLAN. If they're not on the same VLAN, they have to go up here. Like, blah, 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 ah, routed, and then down there. Now, by having it up here, it is attached to the set core switch and one thing that is to, to be aware of that the edge switches are usually perhaps not as powerful as the core switches um, now you can make them as powerful as the core switch because you can buy this type of device and place it everywhere <laughs> But that device is usually rather expensive. Now, that's a, okay, it depends on what speeds you're looking for. If you're wanting 10 gigs, and I would, if I would be building, rebuilding my network today, I would be building 10 gig switches on the edges. I would not be providing 10 gigs to the host or the leaves. I'd be providing one gig to the leaves. But I would be having a 10 gig uplink. Now, if I have a 10 gig uplink up here, that means this device needs to have multiple 10 gig ports. And in order to minimize congestion up, the uplink should preferably be bigger than 10 gigs, right? or it should be aggregations of 10. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly this guy would perhaps need to have, in this case, we have three devices. And how much over provisioning should we have on our distribution switches? If we give them two ports per um, for uplink, that's 20 gigs. So that means that this guy will need six 10 gig ports for the downhaul or the south end. And then it needs a couple of other 
uplink. So yeah, you can get that from a from a 12 port 10 gig switch that has VLAN and link aggregation. In Swedish prices, I would assume that you can get that for around 10,000, 1,000 euros, 1,500 euros in that range, depending a little bit on what manufacturer you pick. Um, these guys here, you can get a simple 10 gig uplink switch from around 1,500, 1,000 euros. Um, but then we're not having that many ports down here. And if you need to upgrade your network, let's say, hmm, we're going to add another distribution switch or three additional distribution switches, then this guy might be running out of ports. Or you need to say, ah, it's not sufficient with 20 gigs up, because my guys, the, 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 my, the end leaves here are generating a lot of up and down traffic. Um, so, you have to, when you dimension infrastructure, um, and now we're talking physical level infrastructure, you should be very careful to dimension so that you can grow for perhaps two or three years without running into trouble. Um, software defined infrastructure is a little bit different because then you can grow in software, right? It's just a configuration. But please remember that that software eventually runs on some hardware. And when that hardware runs out of capacity, if you tell the software, give me a thousand CPUs, but you only have 200, well, software will give you 1,000 CPUs, but those 1,000 CPUs will be matched onto 200. So you every virtual CPU will just be one-fifth of a physical CPU. That's the nasty thing with virtualization. Or a good thing, depending on how you see it. All right. This is a little bit more complicated or larger network. Here we have, you can take perhaps this here as a view of the comp slide before. And now we're putting them together. And suddenly we have a multiple cores, but each system or up entity have their own core and then there's a core somewhere in the middle <clears throat> that interconnects these guys uh, and this is where um, the WAN the WAN comes into play uh, usually the WAN is used to interconnect networks but you can also have WANs in the network of your own. Uh, how many have worked with WANs? How many have worked with LANs? Okay. All right. So they are pretty much the same. The WAN just have a larger latency. But it takes that latency is, is not to be ignored. So, so the thing to have in mind here is this, how things are scaling up. So what previously was a, a core router or a core switch now becomes perhaps a leaf from the, the core network's perspective. Questions on this? Again, if you are frightened by this picture, let me know. <laughs> you shouldn't be frightened. Ah, so this is actually a, 
a company and here's the internet. So they have their own metro e uh, internet there. But this could probably be cross-connecting multiple sites. Right? So terminology and concepts in networking. If I say the OSI layer model, or the OSI model, how many know of that? Okay, so, well, it's good or bad. Um, this is the OSI reference model. It has seven layers. The physical, the data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application layer. When I started studying in the early 90s, uh, there was still a somewhat fight between the internet model and the OSI model. The thought was that the OSI model that was the more researched and perhaps well orchestrated or planned would be the dominant one. As we are now in 2019, we know that did not happen. However, the OSI model is a really good reference model because most people know of it, of it and hence you can reference that when you're talking to someone or you're being introduced to a new technology and then say, well, we're on the data link layer or we're on the session layer. And then you know where in this stack you're located. So in the TCP IP or internet layer model, we have only four layers. We have the link layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and then everything on top of that is the application layer. So some of the protocols, just to give you an idea of where things are belonging. On the physical layer, we have Bluetooth, Ethernet, DSL, ISDN, 802.11, Wi-Fi. On the data link layer, we have ARP, ATM. How many have heard or experienced ATM? It's, it's not the thing that gives you money. <laughs> so that's a synchronous transfer mode. It's still around, but it's dying out. But it's a very good technology for, for some parts. And there's a bunch of other technologies there. On the network level, we have IP. IP version 4 and IP version 6. I'm not really sure if I agree that I, CMP, IGMP, IPX, and RIP belong there. But this is the IP level. This is where we're talking, sending IP data routes. On top of that, that's the transport level. This is where we have UEP, TCP, S, yeah, and a couple of other transport protocols that are belonging to the IP stack. Uh, and then on top of that, we have, for instance, network file system and SQL. I'm not sure why they have that. I would put HD, these guys, they're belonging, all of them are belonging to the application layer. These are file formats. I'm not sure if they're so that they're actually they're, they're they're matching the presentation layer. Okay. Um, the point of this slide is that you will hurt hear or encounter a lot of abbreviations. And once you find an abbreviation or encounter it, you need to, should be able to take that abbreviation and map it either into D 
is PIP or OSI mode? Just so that you understand what they're talking about. Because there will be abbreviations. And it's important to know if, if, if is this a layer two or a layer three technology? Ah, two. Layer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, sorry if we didn't include the number in there. Okay. Questions? All right. So, networking principles. I hope these are not new things. So, we have We have, a, we have I, think, I, would, I would say that we have two communication principles. We have the classical client server principle where someone is serving clients. Um, and then we have the peer-to-peer -peer paradigm where a node can act both as a client and a server. <clears throat> From my point of view, I would say that a peer-to-peer -peer architecture or an entity is just an application that runs both a server and a client and can do both of the things at the same time. But it's, it, it is a very important technology to be aware of peer-to-peer. Because it's it's extremely handy for certain cases, um, but the traditional is the client-server approach. You have a server that is accessible somehow or somewhere, and then the client access that service for contacts the server and gets the service executor done or exchange or done doing something. For transportation, we basically have two parts or two, again, two things to choose from or how you want to call it. We have the reliable transport and we have the unreliable transport. Uh, so Generalizing that one step further, that's TCP versus UDP. Um, I assume that you know what mean, what's meant by reliable. I assume what you know meant by unreliable. Then we got one step further down, we come to the network. And the network can be connection oriented or connection less. In a connection-oriented network, before we can communicate, we need to set up a communication. Um, the traditional example there would be the phone network. And I'm now I'm referring to the analog phones, or digital phones that actually runs through wire lines. Those are connection-oriented. Before you can talk to someone, you need to pick up the handset, dial a number. While you're dialing that, your connection is being set up. And if it reaches your destination, you hear the ringing noise. Meh, meh. And then you have to wait for that guy to pick up the receiver. Or you can have the connection less, which would be IP. Here you just build your message and you ship it out on to the network, and then you pray that it reaches the destination. Uh, most of our networks or communication services today are IP-based, which is good. Uh, but it also comes with some drawbacks and problems. If we lose an IP packet in transit, you don't know. 
you don't know if the if the message that you sent reaches the destination. That is why we have transport protocols on top of that, and especially if it's important that the receiver gets that message, you need to have TCP enable or use TCP, or you need to have an application that includes some kind of error handling to make sure that you either reaches the destination and you get and you're being notified that they received it, or you have some way of handling the case that if you don't get a message back. But it, it, it you can either do that on the transport level or on the application level. But either way you do it, you need to have some way of making uh, tracking it. Now, just to be clear, TCP does not solve, solve everything in IP. If you're trying to send a message to someone that's not online or a device that is not present, TCP will not fix that for you. Or if there's a communication problem, TCP will not fix that for you. It will try, try and try, and eventually it will give up and give you a notification Host unreachable or something. Um, and then we come to the two perhaps things that are not that uh, common anymore today, and that's addressing and service discovery. Addressing is super critical. Because if we don't know the address of the destination or the entity we want to talk to, how do we know how to reach them? Um, so addressing is really important. Um, service discovery is another thing that might have been a bit obfuscated. If I want to, how do I know where a certain service is available. I'm looking for, how do I, first I need to know what service I'm looking for, and then how do I find it? Now, in the internet of today, most services are, are placed on well-known locations. So for instance, if you want to go to, go to google.com, you just go to your browser, you type google.com, press enter. Your browser knows, okay, Google, <coughs> I need to resolve that address into an IP number. It does that. And then as it is a browser, it expects you or assumes that you want to have access to the web server. And the web server is normally placed on TCP port 80 or port 443. And that's the way you reach that service. But now if you want to access another service, how do you know what port you can find that one? We're not going to be dealing too much about service discovery in this class. But it's something that you should not, you should perhaps pay a little bit of attention to it because the amount of services that we're seeing today is growing rapidly. So there's no practical way of knowing where the services are. We cannot assign a port to a, a specific service. We have already done that. We have already used all, most of those, service, those ports. So architecture topology, those are the topologies and architectures that I found, or I am aware of. So we have the classical point to point, where you have one entity communicating to another, perhaps straight away through a wire. We have a bus, we can have a star topology, we can have a ring topology, and we can have a tree topology. And then we have a mesh. 
And a mesh is like a star, but everybody has a link to everybody else, right? And then we have combination of, of these. But those are the principal to topologies. If you are aware of some other topologies, please let me know. Um, as I said, this is like the, po uh, the cable point to point, like this. A sends something here, reaches B, there's no intermediate entity. A bus, bus topology, that is an ethernet, a classical hubbed ethernet. Everybody has a shared medium. When you send something out on that, everybody on that medium hears it. For instance, Wi-Fi is, is that. So when your phones and my laptop are communicating on the same Wi-Fi network, I can hear your traffic and you can hear me. But Ethernet is a bus topology. Uh, has been changed a little bit. Uh, a star is where everybody talks to one entity, and then that guy relays it, right? Uh, and I would say this is how Ethernet looks today. Uh, as long as you're using switched Ethernet, you're going to have a star. You're connecting to a switch, which becomes an entity that provides communication means. Ring, this is where uh, basically a device has two inputs. One egress and then we, one ingress and one egress. So you get the message, you might not be the recipient, and you forward it out to the next one. This is token ring as an example. How many have heard of token ring? All right. It's an old technology, Ethernet comp. Back, back, back in the day, you had Ethernet, you had token bus and token ring. Um, and Ethernet has been the predominant of all of those. Um, token ring and token bus had their own benefits, but Ethernet was cheaper, so it became the dominant technology. That just means that some of the concepts from token ring and token bus are still around and they are now being used at higher levels. Tree? Well, you know how a tree looks like. One in, multiple out. And then the mesh, everybody talks to everybody. Uh, that's good, because then there's no single point of failure compared to a star, but it's pricey. Maintaining many links of communication is, is challenging and difficult. Um, as I said, and then we can have combinations of these. Questions on that? Technology protocol and standard. All right, the point with this slide here is that you need to be aware of the difference between these three uh, terms. You can have a protocol or you can have a technology. Um, let's take an example. Let's take Ethernet. Ethernet is a technology. It is backed up by a protocol, the Ethernet protocol. But it's also defined as a as, as standard. This is the best case scenario. You have a technology that has a protocol and it has a standard. Now, the standard is usually public knowledge, so everybody can read it and implement a, accordingly. Uh, however, as we are in a in a domain where things are moving rapidly, it's quite common that we have technologies that shine up and dazzle everybody. Ooh, this is a cool technology. 
who everybody wants to be on it. And everybody starts working on it from their viewpoint. The, and eventually, perhaps there might become a protocol that is somewhat standardized or not standardized, but the guys that are working on the technology agrees, oh, we should do like this, like this, etc., etc. And eventually, again, if we're lucky, we will end up with a standard. And then you have the, the, a nice path here. But you will be in an environment where you will encounter technologies that are cool, bleeding edge, good for one thing, does that extremely well, but there will never become a protocol or even less a standard. So you should have that in mind. And so sometimes there will be technologies that are cool and really hyped, uh, but they will just be like a butterfly. It lives for a few months or a year, but then nothing else. Um, and if we're talking about infrastructure, we're thinking about things that will have some kind of longevity, lasting for a while. So we want to be in the range of standards when we pick equipment and resources so that we know this will be around for a while. On the other hand, there might be standards that are coming out that will never have any adoption. Um, or a very low on adaptation. So it's, there's no clear solution. There is not always do A, do B or C. Uh, but you need to be aware of the differences here <coughs> or the challenges with either of them. The best if you have something that is covering all three. And then we talk, we need to have some knowledge about computing. Uh, currently, I would say that we have, do we have the I386 anymore? I don't think so. You might encounter it in some uh, embedded devices. But primarily, we have the x86 and the x86-64 architectures. And those are the mainstays, I would say. ARM is around and growing. So you should be aware of that and how it, what features it has that are different from the x86. Um, x86. And what I was not aware and just learned recently is that Apparently, the ARM architecture allows you to do four threads per core versus two threads on the x86. Uh, and that could be handy to know if you end up in a scenario where you're running microservices, where a microservice will usually be consuming a thread. Then, if you have an ARM CPU, you can get twice as many threads as you would from an x86 CPU. Uh, not that much detail, but you should be aware of it, that there is something that's called CISC and that's RIC and RISC. These are CPU architectures. And the next thing that's going to be coming while you're busy doing oper uh, oper when, when you're a professional is quantum computing. There are a few prototype devices around, um, but they will just be coming more and more. And they will probably change a uh, shitload because it's done completely different. Um, you need to be aware of the difference between a 32 and a 64 bit system. Um, if you're not, that will be a challenge. Uh, you also need to be aware of that about endianness. Have you ever heard endianness? This is how the, 
bytes or data is stored in, in a computer. Um, so a byte, you know, is 8 bits, right? And the, uh, the principal difference between big and little NDNs is that if we, if we put the bits in a sequence like this, in big NDNs, I, I, I might be wrong, I always get this wrong, but then just flip it. In big NDNs, the smallest, the first bit here has the lowest, lowest meaning. So that's zero, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32. Whereas in little NDNs, it's different, it, it's the opposite. So that would be 64, 32, 16, et cetera, et cetera. And that has a huge impact when you read a byte. Because if you read the byte zero, zero, okay, it's the same. But if it's what zero zero one, either it's one twenty eight or one, right? And in a network scenario, networking scenario, we might be receiving data from different types of entities. Some will be using small NDN or little NDN. Some will be using big NDN. You should be paying attention. You should be aware of that. Just because you read a byte from the network, that doesn't mean that it's correctly sequenced or you need to know how was that written. The best case scenario or the way it should be done is that everybody on the communication here agrees we use network byte order, which is big NDM. We need to know a little bit about operating systems. You need to know what is a kernel? What is user level? What is system level? And you need to know a little bit about service and demons, or demons. Um, you need to know about software or something. You need to know how the difference between a packaged software and a compiled software. I would like you to be able to install a software pack solution or a software using both a packaged approach and a compiled approach. You should not be afraid of, if someone tells you, hey, can you set up Apache, a web server? And uh, then you should be able to do that just doing <laughs> preferred uh, uh, package manager or the package manager that is used on this particular version of Linux, and then the package name. You should also be able to download the source code from Apache, fix the prerequisites, build it, install it, and launch it as a service. And you also need to know a little bit of configuration. How do you configure services and um, applications in a computer, as well as a network device. All right. That was the last slide. OK. So um, questions. Any questions here? All right. So, um, studying in Sweden is quite different from studying in India, I would say. You have to work on your own. You have to read on your own. As I said, I'm not providing with a reading list. You are expected to be on time for lectures and classes or the schedule events. You're expected to submit on time for the assignments. Um, and you're, you're, you're responsible for finding your own information. I can act as a discussion partner and 
me if you say, I found this and this information. We can discuss that information. Um, but I want you to train your skills on finding information. So I will be reluctant on saying, read that book, that page, or read that entity. I, I've given you three things to read. So. Um, and one more thing. Do not be afraid to ask. During the class, I'm available for you to, to answer your question or try to answer your question. After the class has ended, I will not be available for your uh, questions. Okay? Uh, no more questions? Yeah. Any specific uh, line experience? No, you can pick your own poison. Uh, I'm saying poison with a little bit of a smile because I prefer, right now, I need to say I prefer Ubuntu or Kubuntu. I don't really care about that. If it's Ubuntu, Kubuntu, blah, 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 because I'm using term terminal anyway. Uh, so, but if you like Fedora, go for Fedora. Um, as I'm using, I use Ubuntu because it's based on Debian. And Debian has been around for a while. Um, this is a pick your own poison. Perhaps don't pick something that is um, the absolute bleeding edge, because you don't know how long that fly, uh, that butterfly will be flying around. Um, so I would propose Ubuntu. And I think there's one of the assignments ex that explicitly states that you be using you good. More questions. When will the groups be assigned? Groups have been assigned. And if you have not been assigned to a group, then you have not been entered into uh, Canvas. But once you are entered into Canvas, I will assign you once every day to a group and you sign up by going to student portal and then log on and then registering for your classes there okay more questions all right so you guys that are watching online in the case that you have not received an invite for NANACAD, send me that your email address. Um, if you have not access to Canvas, um, make sure that you have generated your BTH account and that you can log on and then sign up for the class. If you cannot sign up for the class or you cannot have access, you don't have access to your BTH account, send an email to IT help, help Desk. They will, um, they are doing the accounting thing for BTH. With regard to NECACAD, send me your email address. I will, because what I've done in NECACAD is I've taken all the guys that are supposed to be joining the class in BTH, and I just transferred you over to NECACAD, pressed send, and that would trigger an invite to me, all right? Okay, any other questions? No? <laughs> All right, in that case, I will see group one tomorrow, 8.15. That means 8.15 in the room, not 8.16 or not 8.20. Okay? Welcome and hope you will enjoy this class. Um, all right, so in NATACAD, there are no due assignments, due dates for the assignments, because I'm not checking them.
these are assignments for you to train your own skills. These are skills to train your own skills. I hope that was an answer enough for you, Eric. If so, please um, type that in the chat. Um, there will be no live stream tomorrow. I'm not live streaming the workshops. Um, that does not mean that you should not do the exercises. You need to do the exercises. You need to do them on your own. Um, you are, when you are assigned to a group, you will be in group of three. Um, and you, I think we will arrange something for group three so that I will be, you can ask, I'll see how I can do with assignment three, a group three while you're not present so that you can still ask questions. Otherwise, you can ask questions during the Friday online case. All right? Other questions? If you're in group one, you're supposed to be present. Oh yeah? We don't. So my work, so percent. Yeah? What's the law for? Now obviously it's mandatory. <laughs> yeah. Workshops in community go online. Workshop and boy are you on the tree. So we have a week and then it's a schema that we work for two weeks. Ja, det är för att scheman är den vanliga att kalla alla sådana workshops. Så det är, de här första tre veckorna ja. är övningar. Mm. Och eh, så vidare. Mm. Bara, ni, bara när vi kommer till workshops så har vi kunskap. Ja. Mm. Så det är tre obligatoriska workshops. Och det är ju fyra. Så det är en workshop på rapport, den sista. Rapporten också, så att säga. Ja. Allt klart på det här. Så får man också. Ja, <laughs> men det var kul att höra att ni är klara. <laughs> ja, men du har väl erfarenhet från tillämpan, va? Men du har klarat den, va? Mm. Jag har inte många som klarar den här, va? Jo, då, till slut är det. Mm. Ja, det är så. Ja, det är så. Are you in group one? The exercises that you're in, I, I asked the same question for him in Swedish. Uh, during the first three weeks, it's just exercises. Mm -hmm. So it's not mandatory presence. Okay. Uh, but I would strongly argue that you attend. I would strongly argue you never move it fast. Just another friend that I have is not able to get all this money. This time I have lost all the institution position. This way I am trying to open an online food bank so that I can spend mm -hmm. more easily and it can be good at food. Mm -hmm. It gives me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand. Um, so, um, are you trying? But, but, but if you make other appointments for future reference, make sure that you make them. Yeah when you don't have scheduled activities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the other canvas, I will be in short because I am able to see that process earlier. But last day after mm -hmm. I see it on uh, Thursday mm -hmm. and the appointment was given uh, ah. 15 days ago. Okay. So if I couldn't change it I would go anywhere in that they said if you cancel it you're gonna get it after March and my another patient will be getting to this March. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what when do you sign up for the class or register on the class? 
But you didn't see it in canvas until Thursday. Yeah, Thursday or just the day before it. Because the two courses were not coming on the canvas. But you but you saw them in student portal, right? Yeah, I just researched them in, in the student portal. Uh, not the nice way, not the decorate the fruits kind of like Yeah, but, but as I said in and I have some problem with my canvas as well, it's in Swedish. So I did it. Canvas, no, Canvas is a web app, right? Yeah. Um, you're meaning on your phone. Yeah, on my phone. Use it for, you have a laptop? I have a laptop. You use that one instead. Okay, yes. Um, it's more but the, what I noticed when I was in, when I'm using Canvas, yeah. Canvas changes language depending on what class you're into and what language that class has defined as default. So I, I I go into this class, I can't remember if it's Swedish or English, and then uh, everything changes to English yeah. or Swedish. Uh, in the LP1, it was in English, and from LP2, it started in Swedish, in my phone. No, 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 it, it depends on, as I said, it, it, in the computer, yeah. if you go to an English class, mm -hmm. everything in Canvas changes to English. Yeah. But if you go to the Swedish class, everything changes to Swedish. So it depends on the specific class. And in the case you were lucky, both of those classes had Swedish yeah, as but, their yeah. default language. Yeah. But was the menus as well in Swedish? Uh, menu? Yes. I can uh, show you. Ah, bugger. I'll check that. It's a um, canvas, uh, the menu is in English. Yeah. But the uh, menu is. Yeah, what is I don't menu? see. Okay, I don't use the camera. Yeah, and the Swiss, the mathematical resources, Swiss, everything has become Swedish suddenly. Oh, Swiss suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends per class. Even the routine is also in Swedish. Yes. Yeah, but I think you can you can change this to English somewhere. Uh, maybe in the settings. No, 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 not here. In Courses. Uh, as I said, yeah. I think uh, these from now, on, I, yeah, from now on I try to figure out the courses by the course. Yeah. Then you can get scared. Yeah. 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 Yeah, networking. And I have done a sister course in one of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is one point five years. So well, then you should not. Then again. you should not have a problem with these things. No, I have to go to the room just a little bit. So mm -hmm. You know, you're being live streamed now. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Uh, seriously. Okay. Thank you. So, those of you that are in group one. I would expect it to be on site. Um, if you haven't received what group you belong, if you don't know what group you belong, that's because I have not assigned you to a group. And in order for me to assign you to a group, you need to be registered in Canvas. You need to be entered into Canvas and to get into Canvas you need to be registered on the class. And then as far as I knew once you're registered in the student portal on the class it will just take a few one day or 24 hours before you're into Canvas and once you're in Canvas I will assign you to a group. Uh, so in the case you don't know what group you belong to that's the reason. Um, as I said, I expect people in group one and two to be present. Um, during the seminar tomorrow. 
if you are if you are not present or you will not be able to be present because you're traveling and you're still back somewhere else and you will not be be in Sweden in the, the nearest one or two days um, you need to let me know I will then transfer you to a different group more question um, as I said if you have not identified if you're not having access to canvas you cannot identify what group you belong to I am you need to take the following steps. You need to make sure that you are registered for the class on studentportalen.bth.fc and once that is done you will be granted access to Canvas and once you're in Canvas I will assign you to a group. Um, so I don't know what group you belong to. Either you have access to Canvas and then you can see which group you belong to if you don't have access to Canvas, you will most likely be longing to Group 3. Um, yes, so those guys that are, I am aware of that have not received their visa certificates or um, cards, uh, you will by default be belonging to Group 3. Um, but um, so unless uh, until you have access to canvas um, you should focus on doing the netacad assignments or the classes and hopefully your canvas access will be fixed this week um, so that you can work on the exercises on your own, on your own laptops, and um, answer your questions uh, you know what I'm gonna send out a doodle um, to identify um, Uh, no, no. Um, if you have been assigned, okay, so Mershala, you have been assigned to group one. That's good, but um, yeah, that would. Vamsi, that would be my view, uh, my assumption as well. But apparently, there are some people, Mershala, that apparently um, has access to Canvas. Um, has access to a canvas and then I assigned people to group one and two. Um, so I'm gonna formulate an email and send out to everybody. Um, and then I will move people from group one and two in, over into group three if you belong to JNTU. JNT, 
Kakinata, basically. Because I assume you're not here, but if you're here, great, let me know. I'll keep you in group one and two. Um, Siva, uh, okay, you've been assigned, you have access to Canvas, but you don't find any information. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, have you registered in student portal to the class? You have registered, okay. And then I think it's just a matter of timing here because I would expect that your registration has have been parsed once, but um, but for some reason the class has not been transferred yet. So it might take another 24 hours. I'm not sure how access works, uh, but I suspect that the Canvas thing might take a little bit, um, the, the class type might take another 24 hours. It's not as, um, here's a solution answer, but this is the one I can give you. But I think it just take, take a little bit more time, 24 hours, hopefully, nothing more. Uh, any other questions? Right. Um, if you have questions or uh, concerns, um, please put them in email address. Email, send them to me. I will um, and explain your issue. That if if you are not on B in Sweden, Sweden or not on BDH within the nearest three three days, let me know and. Um, let me know your expected arrival date. Let me know whether or not you have access to Canvas and that you, whether or not you can see the class and whether or not you have received um, the NetAcad invite. So put those in, that information in email and send it to me. I will then um, assign you to an appropriate group once you're in Canvas. And I will also investigate what happened to the net, net ACAD invite, whether or not it has been sent to you or not. If it has been sent, I will resend it again. Okay. So, um, thank you for your participation. Hope it has worked out for you. And it seems to have worked out for you. All right. Have a nice day. See you soon.